Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Spokane City Council briefing session for October 17th. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Bingle? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Zappone? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Perkins to brief the October 24th legislative agenda. Thank, thank you, Council President Beggs, members of the City Council, Johnny Perkins, City Administrator. This is the advanced briefing for Monday, October 24. Item number one is now cleared for departure. It is the Spokane Airport Board 2023 budget. Joining us today is Larry Crowder, the Chief Executive Officer of both Fels Field and the Spokane International Airport, and Mr. Rob Schultz to present their 2023 Airport Board budget. Mr. Crowder, you are cleared for departure. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. We'll release the brakes and push the throttles up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, council President, uh, good afternoon. Members of Council, good afternoon. I just want to start out by saying how much we appreciate the support uh, that we receive from Council uh, as well as City Administrator. Um, and uh, we're presenting a budget uh, this afternoon. Our CFO, Rob Schultz, will walk you through it. I'm here uh, to answer questions uh, and back up uh, my partner here, Rob. Um, and uh, as I like to say, we really are uh, delivering a tremendous amount of economic benefit to the region. Um, and that's what we get up every single day excited to do. And uh, just again, just want to thank you all so much for being part of our team and uh, for supporting us as we go forward and, and really try to enhance that economic benefit of, of the airports. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob um, and uh, I'll be here if you need anything else. Mm -hmm. Sorry, thanks Rob. Good afternoon, Council. Appreciate the time uh, to be here today. And I'm gonna go ahead and flip over. <coughs> Okay, so we are here to discuss the 2023 budget for Spokane Airports. And we'll go ahead and start off. One of the things, um, just to let you know, we are not requesting any funds from the city uh, for this year, for 2023. Uh, airport is financially self-sufficient um, on there. We will give you a briefing uh, as we go through here, and I'll talk about a couple highlights in terms of our, both our operating budget as well as our capital budget. So as we mentioned, the airport is financially self-sufficient um, on it. Uh, funds come from system users on there. I won't go through all of the operating revenues uh, there, but what we have is some of the major drivers of our operating revenue that we have uh, at the airport. Also listed below is some of the capital projects. Uh, so as you'll see later in the presentation, we have a large capital program uh, this year, uh, excuse me, 2023. Uh, and those are some of the revenues that used to fund some of those capital projects that we have. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about uh, some of those uh, a little bit later on. And just one thing to keep in mind as we talk about some of the capital programs uh, and some of the revenue sources, for, uh, the funding sources for those, uh, they can be used for very specific approved purchases. Uh, most of those are federal administratively um, handled by us. So with that, I'll just touch real briefly on our budget process, won't spend a lot of time on this slide. Uh, what this one here really is talks about the overview of uh, the process that we take. One of the things that uh, we wanted to keep in mind this year as we start looking at 2023 is the potential for a recession. And what does that look like in terms of the airport? How does that impact the activity? And some of our assumptions going into that. And so we start with um, kind of gathering information, if you will. So from the airlines, we talk about what their schedule is gonna be like, what the assumptions are from their standpoint. Kind of look at also in terms of, like I said, the re potential recession impact on what that uh, number may be. So we put all those in, those activities uh, on there, and uh, it kicks out essentially some uh, information for us related to what we call rates and charges. So essentially what the airlines are going to pay uh, to call Spokane Airport as well as to rent space at the terminal itself. That results in a rate setting uh, for there, and we'll go through a little bit of those charges here in a few minutes. So this uh, summary is a five-year look at activity. And so we track really two things that drive some of the activity and revenue sources at the airport. Uh, the first one is employments or passengers. Uh, the second one is landed weight. On the left-hand side of this chart is the traffic activity. And you'll see we have a five-year comparison because really, uh, really we're all kind of shooting for back to 2019 level. So that pre-pandemic number, uh, obviously 2020 was the largest hit in terms of the impact of the pandemic started to rebound in 21 as well as continue that on to 22. 
One of the things I mentioned uh, previously on the other slide is the recession impact in terms of what that may look like. And again, that's speculative on our part. What we wanted to do is have a little bit of conservatism in this. And so the approach that we took is we, are, we were trending toward pre-pandemic levels in 2022. We wanted to just really kind of slow that down a little bit in terms of that recovery. So it's not necessary that we're predicting a drop next year in traffic. Really what it is is a slowdown of recovery to where uh, the pre-pandemic levels that we had prior uh, to the pandemic. So what we are, you can see the forecast right there. So we're going to be up slightly compared to the 2022 estimate, about 2.3%, but still below 2019 levels by about 3%. So again, unknown in terms of what that impact may be, but we wanted to take a conservative approach um, in terms of how that is going to impact our budget. On the right-hand side is landed weight. That's essentially what the airlines call. So that's essentially both uh, passenger and cargo activity at the airport and take a look in terms of what that is. A bulk of that change that you see on that lower right-hand side of that really relates to cargo. Um, and so there's been an increase in cargo activity over the last handful of years, including uh, the Amazon brings in daily service uh, at the airport on there. So that's reason for really that cargo increase that you see on the uh, right-hand side of that chart. A little bit about the, just the process and where we are with it. So we do consult with the airlines. Uh, so we have what is called the Airport Airline Affairs Committee. So we met with them on October 4th. Uh, we will take this to the Spokane Airport Board on Thursday, the 20th. Um, and then we have the rest of the process approval for the budget, which is City Council on the 24th. And then we'll go to the Board of County Commissioners as well uh, the following day on the 25th. One thing to note on here is really kind of that middle part says rate summary. That's one of the really the key outputs in terms of what that impact is on the budget or what that looks like. For us, there's really two uh, major components to it. So terminal rent, that's essentially what is the airlines, how much does it cost for them to rent space at the airport itself. That is increasing from $60.70 to $63.02. That increases about 3.8%, which considering the environment we're in with inflation, uh, is very reasonable, we feel like. So we've been managing our expenses really well on that side uh, of that uh, component. Also, landing fee. Uh, it's a 3.7% increase from 2022 levels, so it's uh, $2.24 per thousand pounds of landed weight. And that's essentially a measurement in terms of what the airlines uh, pay to land at the airport. This is a, a little hard to read um, on this slide. I'll walk you through it real quick. Left-hand side of this, really, where the non-operating is, what those revenue streams are are really uh, restricted funds. So they can be only used for very specific purposes. So uh, we have a customer facility charge that, uh, you get, uh, that it's charged when you rent a car at the airport. That goes for a very specific purpose. That can't be used to benefit the airlines. That can really be used only to benefit the rental car agencies themselves. Also, we have other funding sources that can be used only for either um, essentially terminal improvements uh, on there, as well as grants, which goes to fund a lot of our capital projects. And I'll touch base on that a little bit uh, in a later slide in terms of our funding sources for that. On the right-hand side, I won't go through all of the detail, but the green essentially is revenue sources coming in. Uh, the red is uh, expenses uh, going to be out. Um, and those relate to essentially our usable cash in terms of what we have remaining on there, and that will go to either help fund capital projects or go to maintain operating reserves at the airport. Next slide is just a little bit about 22 in terms of where we think we might be at the end of the year. I think really two main points on this one is right now we are tracking above on operating revenues, uh, but below on operating expenses, so a good place to be uh, in terms of where we are in 22. Uh, and then the bottom one, I'm going to try to name all the acronyms that we use. We, we do use quite a few. Uh, CPE is a cost per employment, and that's really an uh, airport metric that looks at what does it cost airlines uh, to call or be uh, present at the airport itself. So in terms of 2023, um, a couple things to note on here. I won't go through all the detail. On this, but one thing to keep in mind when we when compared to the 2022 budget, one of the items that we had is we didn't really know how the recovery was going to go in 2022 in terms of uh, from the pandemic. And so when you see the large increases either on operating revenue or operating expenses, it was just that unknown of what things were going to look like and how it was going to morph throughout the year. I think really what I wanted to concentrate is the bottom part of this slide, uh, capital improvement program. So for 2023, we have an operating or excuse me, a capital improvement program 
uh, north of $123 million, which is one of the largest ones in our history on there. And a good chunk of that relates to the expansion project we have at the airport, Concourse C, uh, Terminal Renovation and Expansion Project. That's what TREX stands for. That, is, uh, that already is underway, uh, so we have broken ground on that project. Uh, that's a $150 million project uh, that will utilize various funding sources for that, so one of the largest in history. But related to that also, we have a lot of other program, program needs out there. So we have about $72 million in various um, grants, uh, both airport improvement program, bipartisan <laughs> infrastructure law, as well as um, the PFC and CFC funds. The 17.3 there in Concourse C Trex, which may include debt uh, financing, just a quick note on that, is we will be issuing uh, debt related uh, for the airport to help uh, fund that program. When that is or what that may look like uh, is yet to be unknown. We think it might be in 2023 um, on there, but we wanted to make note of that. Uh, where right now we have no debt on our books. Uh, this will be one of them, but that again, that pays for a lot of the capital program at airports typically is issued by debt. And so we will end up doing a debt issuance sometime, potentially either this year or we may push it back to 2024, depending upon uh, other avenues that we're uh, exploring. And then the final one is about $34 million of airport funds uh, that we will utilize to help pay for that capital improvement program. In terms of operating expenses, just one thing to note, what you saw on those increases on the previous one. So essentially what we're trying to do is return staffing levels to pre-pandemic. Uh, so we did reduce that when the pandemic hit. Uh, we are with increased business activity wanting to get back to those pre-pandemic levels. Also, um, increased materials and supplies costs uh, due to inflation and just the challenges of getting uh, supplies at certain times. And then this year, uh, La Nina is predicted for a winter and so that leads to a little bit higher in terms of uh, costs related to snow removal as well as de-icing material used to help clear runways and sidewalks and roadways. With that, this is just a summary of our capital improvement program by funding source. Uh, PFC is the passenger facility charge. Uh, so essentially we're gonna use some cash funds from PFC to help pay for the terminal renovation project. Also mentioned the debt issuance already. I think the last two probably are noteworthy, uh, the airport funds. So we have a lot of various programs out there in terms of uh, capital improvements for the airport. Uh, so we have roadway improvements, we have some parking lot uh, expansions or improvements. Uh, cargo ramps, and so really big, heavy year for us in terms of capital program for it. Also, we are, uh, have federal grants uh, through the FAA uh, for terminal ramp construction, uh, as well as potential other grants for Concourse C Trex program. So, a lot of funding sources out there uh, for a capital improvement program that we have. And this is the final slide, which is our budget summary um, on there. And so we have a comparison to 2022. Those are the percent, percents you see either on the right or left-hand side. But our consolidated budget uh, total is $174,295,905. That includes both operating and capital. You can see the breakdown between our various cost centers, so the Spokane International Airport, the business park that's adjacent to the airport, as well as Feltz Field on the east side of town. Um, you can see the breakdown both on the operating and the capital side in the bottom two charts. I'll pause there. Actually, I'll pause there. That is the conclusion of my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have um, on either material uh, or other questions. Yes. Thank you for that. I just want, I don't want to burst your bubble, but we're supposed to have a triple El Nino this winter. That is, so we did account for that. And we actually have at our board meeting on Thursday, okay. we do have Noah coming in to give us a triple and we have heard all this from the airlines as well as to make sure that we have uh, the right. staffing needed to make sure the runways and taxiways are yep. clear that's for us that's all the airlines so. cared about is there enough snow personnel is yes. exactly they, <laughs> they actually did when we had that consultation meeting with them that was one of the things they actually noted uh, on there is make sure we have appropriate staff for that okay i bet you're looking forward to that too i, I actually am yeah yeah triple. <laughs> yes so in that uh, infrastructure package that, uh, that passed, how much money did that bring into uh, to the airport? Yeah, there's really a couple different um, components to that bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, related to airports, there's really two main uh, programs there, if you will. Uh, the first one is uh, called AIG program, which is the Airport Infrastructure Grant. 
That's a formulaic grant that each airport gets in the nation uh, in terms of as part of the overall airport system. That's 6.4 million uh, that we received through that program on there. That is a five-year program and we will receive approximately that amount each year. The other one is a um, competitive grant program and that's an airport terminal program, ATP. And we received $11 million in year one. And both of those are gonna go help fund the Concourse C Trex program that we have. Uh, we will apply for years two and three throughout that program because it is a five-year program as well. Uh, but a competitive grant, we don't know how we'll do in year two. Uh, we hope that we will do either similar, maybe even better. Um, but again, speculative on that point. Uh, at this point, it's, uh, we, have our, we will get our application in by the end of the month. I think we'll hear beginning of 2023 about that. Okay, so in that, uh, the 17 million that you had for the, for the concourse, is that what those two amounts were that? that no, that's actually, million? if I can go back real quick here. So the 17 million it actually is uh, probably debt funding. Okay. Uh, so really the, uh, your program is really on that, or your question, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, is in the 71.9 million at the top line there. So that bill, the bill grant there, mm -hmm. that is the 17 million, 17.4 million that we've already received. And again, we're making some assumptions on year two and three of the AIG, uh, the formulaic grant. Uh, we just don't know quite yet what that number will be for the competitive grant program. Mm -hmm. Nice, I just have one last question. When was the last time the airport needed city funding? Because I know that it's, you typically run on your, run on your own. I'm, I'm not sure if we've ever. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, to uh, Councilwoman Wilkerson's great joy. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Crowder knows that. That's right. <laughs> yeah, thank, yeah you. thank you for your yeah. questions. Appreciate it. I'm just wondering if Larry could invite us out to the groundbreaking on Thursday. We canceled our study session so that we could come out there. <laughs> but I'm just wondering if you could invite us out and tell us how to park in the event center. That's right. Yeah. Parking space. You're all very welcome. And we hope that as many of you uh, as possible will attend. Uh, we'll have, we do have some specific um, instructions because we're actually going to be taking you down an access road and onto the uh, air carrier parking uh, apron uh, where we'll have a tent set up uh, near the construction site for the um, event. So we should show up by what time at the event center? That's where we show up at the event uh, center? Actually, we'll, we'll actually, we have women's driving instructions. You can actually drive oh, okay. straight you to the You can drive straight there. Mm -hmm. So okay. I would just recommend uh, you, you show up around 1030, quarter to 11. Okay. All right, nice. Great, yeah, we canceled our meeting, so you can go. And you get, a, you get a, to hold a shovel. Mm. I know none we of you have, have done that. We have some work for you to do. <laughs> no, not I told Mr. Crowder the first time I get to throw dirt, I can't attend, so I'm disappointed about that. Real dirt. <laughs> what if? We'll have more, I promise. Yeah. What if we're gonna be at the airport Wednesday and Friday, but out of town on <laughs> Thursday? <laughs> Virtual. Stop by the office. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Schultz, Mr. Crowder, thank you very much, gentlemen. Good to see both of you. Thank, thank you very much. We'll see you Appreciate soon. Your time. Thank okay. you, Council. Yeah. All right, item number two on our consent agenda for Monday, October 24, is a value blanket renewal with specialty asphalt products for the purchase of crack sealant. And our presenter is Mr. Clint Harris. Good afternoon, Council President and Council. The Street Department is requesting to renew a value blanket contract for the purchase of Premier Crack Seal from Specialty Asphalt at a cost not to exceed 125000 annually. Questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Item three on the consent agenda is a five-year value blanket with M&L supply for as-needed purchases of backflow prevention assemblies. Our presenter is Tanya Reese. Hello, Council President and Council. Uh, the Water Department is proposing a five-year value blanket for m &L, um, Supply Company for $250,000 for backflow assemblies. The staff recommends approval of the value blanket. Just a short explanation of what that is. Mm -hmm. is. Is that pieces of equipment? It's a piece of equipment that is installed on the water service line to keep water from entering back into the water system from any of the buildings. Else? Thank you. Thank you. Item number four is a personal services agreement with Spokane Arts to manage the residential street mural and community crosswalks program. Our presenter, I believe, is online from the Office of Neighborhood Services. Annie Deasy. 
Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon, um, Johnny. Yes, we have a three-year pilot project with Spokane Arts to oversee the street, mural, and community crosswalks program. It's a three-year program that will deliver up to 29 crosswalks and, or sorry, correct me, uh, 29 murals within all 29 neighborhoods should they elect to apply and up to six crosswalks, two per district. Thank you, Ms. Deasy, appreciate that. Okay. Item five is a series of property tax exemption conditional agreements. 5A is with Finley O and Susan M. Gillespie. 5B, McLemur on Sprague LLC. 5C, East Magne Magnesium Pro Properties. 5D, Mission One Properties. 5E, A Better Way, LLC. 5F, John Malay for the future construction of uh, approximately 10 units of a, a, a parcel in the city. And finally, 5G is East Central Community Organization. Our presenter is Terry Stripes. Council President, Council. Last month I told you we broke a record. I brought you six conditional agreements. This month I've brought you seven. In November, I am a little concerned because I've only currently had I only currently have one application. Mm -hmm. So we may be seeing some impacts from the housing market. So pay attention to that. I'm not going to go through a detailed presentation today on these. It is in your packet for you as well as the public. So I'm gonna give you some highlights. Um, I heard at Urban Experience, people were wondering about which projects were projects of citywide significance. In this list, seven of, or excuse me, four of them are. You've got Magnesium Village with 504 units. You've got the triplex with an internal ADU. Uh, by Chauncey Jones on Fifth Avenue, the Rose, which was the apartment building, the old historic building that was moved. They are adding a fourplex to that lot, and that is also projects of citywide significance. And then Mission Avenue is adding 27 new units, and that will be under projects of citywide significance. Two of these projects are also Boca. Fifth Avenue and the Rose fall under the BOCA, the building opportunities for all. So uh, with projects of citywide significance, in addition to these multifamily tax exemption projects you're looking at today, we've allocated all 13, over 1,100 units to be constructed under that prog program with multifamily tax exemption with an, a construction value of $250 million. Do you have any specific questions on your multifamily projects? This is more a curiosity question. So the 504 uh, units, how many complexes are of that size? Oh, you in the had city? to ask. I know. I think there's 36 buildings or there's 14 buildings with 36 units each. I, now I can't recall. I'm sorry. I can send you those details. Yeah, it's a huge plot in a, in a neighborhood. I know that there's a lot of activity that's going to be happening there, which is great. Um, in the in the city as a whole, how many um, uh, how many like complexes, apartment complexes like this are of that size? Five hundred units. It would be a small handful. Yeah, and I I can think of a couple off the top of my head, but I don't have a list in my mind of all of them. Okay. I had a general question for you. So we've been having a lot more projects, which is great, but are we charging enough administrative fees to cover the personnel so costs? Remember, um, when we did the uh, multifamily tax exemption adjustments mm -hmm. in August, we increased the fees so that we could capture that administrative cost. Okay, great. And all of these projects of the seven, only one of them is under the old ordinance, and that's the Macklemore building in the Sprague district. Another little piece to think about in Sprague, we did that street rebuild and the streetscape improvements and all of that. This is one of the first times we're gonna see a building replaced for a mixed use project, and that's an old derelict building that is going to be removed for that project. 
Uh, um, are all of these the the twelve year or some a mix? No, or? I'm sorry. Of um, of these, you've got I think it's four. You've got Fifth Avenue, which is a twelve year. Thirty first is a twelve year program. Okay. The Rose and also Mission Avenue. Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Terry. Item number six. A low bid of home construction for Nevada Joseph Pedestrian Hybrid Beacon and Bemis Elementary walk route improvements. Item seven is a contract with David Evans and Associates for the design of the Maple Street Bridge deck. And item eight is a contract with KPFF Consulting Engineers for the design of the Washington Stevens Bridge deck. And a presenter on all three items is Dan Buller. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Perkins said, proposed item six is a proposed low bid contract with Holmy Construction of Spokane for Nevada Joseph Pedestrian Hybrid Beacon and Liberty Bemis Elementary School Sidewalk Project for $836,106 to which we propose to set aside a 10% administrative reserve. This project installs a pedestrian crossing at Nevada and Joseph. Joseph is on the south edge of Nevada Park which is adjacent to Gary Middle School. The other part of the job is a sidewalk installation in the vicinity of Bemis Elementary and Ripon Field. And also included in that project is pedestrian crossing signal across Crestline at Cortland. We saw six bids, which was more than we've been seeing for a while. Um, and consequently, the bids were great, $270,000 less or about 24% below engineer's estimate. This work mm -hmm. is mostly grant funded and work will begin and end next summer. Item seven. Um, proposed contract with David Evans of Spokane to design the Maple Street Bridge deck rehab in the amount of $288,527. David Evans was selected via request for qualifications process as outlined in state law. The bridge work is funded with a federal grant and is currently planned for the 2024 construction season. And item eight, same thing, different bridge, different contractor, KPFF of Seattle. For the Washington Stevens bridges, there's three bridges there, as you know, um, over the North Channel and the South Channel, in the amount of $297,094. Same process, an RFQ process in accordance with state law, um, Fed funded, and planned for the 2023 construction season. So we're approving all this uh, design for the toppings of these bridges. Money funding, we just getting the engineering services in place for funding opportunities for these bridges that um, engineers are looking at for surfacing over? I did not catch that, I'm sorry. Okay, so on design for the Maple Street Bridge, redecking on the one for, um, where's this other one? Stevens Bridge, redeck, rehabilitation, so we're getting all the designs in place. Is there money, where will the money come to actually do the work? Oh, and we actually have the you Fed funding have? for construction okay. lined up okay. as well. Sorry. Yep. Thank you. Also Fed funded. <clears throat> I just quickly wanted to say I'm, I'm excited for the, um, for the sidewalk that's going in for people to, to walk to school. In, you know, in our district, we have a ton of people who are walking to school. Uh, you know, as family members are working and both parents are working and those kinds of things. And so I'm really excited about the Safe Routes to School program and I hope we continue to do a lot more of that to give people, uh, you know, kids safe ways to, to get to school, so. Good deal, we have six planned for this year. This is two, I think you've seen one with three more in the next couple months I'll be coming here. Yeah, I live um, by Shiloh Hills Elementary and I think I saw one even for that school as well. So yeah, should be great. Dan, do you, do you know by chance about how long these bridges will be under construction? Mm -hmm. Uh, three-ish months that we don't, that's, it doesn't, that, I'm not, that's not to say that they'll be entirely shut that whole right. time um, when we're, um, <clears throat> the intent is to not shut them for the entire construction process, but there is. But some for some, some portion of 2023, they'll be shut down, yeah. most likely. Okay. Uh, 23 for the, the Washington Stevens in advance of the stadium, and then Maple mm -hmm. in 24. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Buller. Nice to see you. Item nine on the Monday, October 24, advanced agenda, consent agenda, is a contract amendment with GHD Incorporated, develop future infrastructure concept designs and cost associated with the city of Spokane, continuing to provide the city of Airway Heights with water service. Our presenter is Marcia Davis. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. 
Good afternoon, Council. Council President. The uh, city has just completed an agreement with the City of Airway Heights for continued water service. This amendment to our contract with GHD will allow us to do some analysis of what capital projects will need to be in place to serve Airway Heights into the future. Questions? Yes. Marcia, can you go into a little bit of detail about the um, pipe that needs to be built under um, I-90 about the, the tower, so some of the things that need to happen for them to be served? Sorry. It's a water system, so there's a lot of moving parts, so I'm... Uh, the big stuff, so just the big stuff. The big stuff. stuff is what you're going to want to know. Well, every, if people have been out towards the airport, you've been able to see the... Um, our water reservoir, um, that's about halfway done, halfway in construction. That is, uh, there's two pressure zones in the West Plains, and so we need to provide extra capacity to continue to serve airway heights. So that, uh, that tank is really important. We also soon, our design is underway for a pipe that will go underneath the interstate, connecting that tank to the rest of the system. In addition, on our six-year program, we have several projects, uh, a booster station, and some pipelines that we envision we will, we will need for future. And what this study will do is it'll do two things. It'll help us to understand what proportion of that need will come from airway heights for both their uh, current and you know, whatever future capacity they may request. It also will look at... Um, because it's a system that uh, those pressure zones serve, air, are interties with Airway Heights, Fairchild, Air Force Base, uh, Medical Lake. They also serve the West Plains uh, PDA um, and the county and the city of Spokane. So it's a big area. It's a big area that's got a lot of growth. And um, it's a lot of details we need to look at to, to say, what, what do we need to the future? What will that cost be? And how do we proportion that? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Appreciate that. Item 10 is an agreement, amendment to with GeoCo doing business as live stories for additional relocation award of ERA funds 1.0. And item 11, award of additional eviction rent assistance program ERAPA 2.0 funds from the Department of Commerce for 11A, the Carl Maxey Center, 11B, Family Promise, 11C Live Stories. Our presenter on both items 10 and 11, who I believe is online, is Devin Beviano. City Administrator, while he's coming online, I will be abstaining from number 11 as I am the president of the Carl Maxey Center. Thank you, Council Member Wilkerson. In there. Move on. Okay. We will return to Mr. Baviano momentarily. In the meantime, uh, consent item. 12 for the advance briefing on Monday, October 24, report of the mayor on pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library, 11A, or pardon me, 12A, 12B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations, and item 13, city council meeting minutes, 12A and B, along with 13, will be completed and ready for council consideration on Monday, October 24th. So, Devin, I will return to you, sir. We can't hear you. <laughs> You're talking. He's, he's working through some things. Is there any idea? There you are. Oh, we can hear you now.
like some connection issues. Now we can't. I think he's having some connection issues. Why, why don't we Just why don't we do this, yeah. Council President? If we can move to emergency ordinances. Yeah. Okay. And then we can come back to Devin. So emergency ordinance, the first one up is specifying the process for the conduct of uh, collective bargaining. And the other one I thought we would do back to back because I have another presenter who will do his back to back uh, is an ordinance relating to the fire and police dispatch service personnel, which both serve under you. All right. So uh Emergency ordinance uh, regarding collective bargaining. This is something that we brought to council in late August, and it would require that before the administration signed a tentative agreement with a bargaining unit, they would at least come to council and present what their plan was in an executive session ahead of time. Not that council would stop it or approve it, just they would get the feedback. Uh, we had some feedback from collective bargaining groups that said they wanted um, some time to give us feedback on that. And that time is all almost expired. But I did get an email today from at least one group. And I know City Administrator Perkins reached out to the various groups and let them know this was coming. So I'm hoping we'll get some more feedback before we vote on it. And then the, is it first reading? No, wait. It's uh, under emergency ordinance. Also an emergency Fire ordinance. Fire and police dispatch service okay. personnel. So this has to do with Shrek. Uh, we've discussed that fire at this point is running out of dispatchers and uh, is looking to join, uh, have Shrek do the fire dispatch for us. Um, and we have a law, a couple of laws on the books that prohibit them from doing police or fire dispatch without city employees. This would... Uh, roll back that requirement in exchange for making sure that we had board members on Shrek and there are a few other requirements that we heard from uh, community members that they wanted to make sure that the Shrek opportunity would work well so and it doesn't it, it would just go into effect right away regardless of when the city actually figured out what they were doing All right, thank you, Council President. Mr. Beviano, I'm gonna come back to you one more time to see if you are ready to present. Yeah. All right. Moving on then. To our next presenter. This would be a special emergency ordinance, amending interim zoning ordinance and amending Spokane Municipal sections to clarify requirements for the airport overlay zones and siding parking facilities in relation to streets and residential structures. And then we have uh, a resolution that Mr. Gardner will also be presenting, which is approving the Planning Commission's 2022-2023 work program. Spencer Gardner, our Planning Director. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Hello, Council. Um, we've talked about both of these. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. The first is clarifying a couple of requirements within the interim zoning ordinance not changing anything, but uh, we had some questions about language, and so we've introduced some clarifications just so that everybody's on the same page about what's required. Um, and one of those is related to airport overlay zones, and then the other is related to the placement of parking um, relative to a house. So those are the two issues for the interim zoning ordinance. And then the work plan, uh, we presented on that last week. Tyrrell was here to present on that. If you, I, I don't think there was any questions. I know, Councilmember Cathcart, that there was um, some language change passed around to add, specifically add cottage housing. I think we got that in by the time it went into on base. Is that right? I thought it was tiny lots. Tiny, tiny lots. Oh, yeah, lot sorry, specific, tiny lots yeah. in the cottage yeah. housing mm -hmm. along with the cottage housing. And it, it sounded like that was what was going to happen. I so. believe we have it in on base already. I can confirm that, but um, that, was, uh, that was my understanding. So 
Uh, are there any other questions about the work plan 2022-2023? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Our next item under resolutions is recognizing accepting the Division Concept Connect study. And our presenter is Colin Quinn Hurst. I think we're calling an audible here, maybe. No. No. Colin and I, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, good afternoon. I'm here with Amanda Beck from Planning Services and Jason Lean from Spokane Regional Transportation Council, their principal planner. And we're gonna give an update on the final report of this two year long study that's been underway since 2020. So just first off a review of the process so far. Uh, phase one was done in 2020 and adopted in 2021 by the Spokane Transit Authority in April. It, we came to a finance committee with city council at that time with an update on the locally preferred alternative for bus rapid transit on division. And then it was adopted by the Spokane Regional Transportation Council in June of that year. This year we've come to city council in June to urban experience in the study session. And then again in September to urban experience. And the SRTC board adopted uh, the phase two report in September. So a little bit of background on this study. Primarily, it's looking at Division Street spurred in part by the opening of the North Spokane corridor towards the end of this decade, recognizing that that opens an opportunity on Division by decreasing highway traffic pressure and freight pressure on Division to rethink how we, we use that street and what Division is for the city. Uh, so the first phase looked primarily at the street reconfiguration itself on Division uh, for bus rapid transit, similar to the city line, the east-west line that's finishing construction right now. It also looked at how to balance and support all transportation modes on the corridor. Um, the phase two took a step back and looked beyond the borders of the right-of-way to how we support transit-oriented development, creating mixed uses at the transit station areas and creating a walkable pedestrian-oriented environment. So here's the outcome of phase one, just a quick review of, of what phase one produced. On the division Ruby couplet, um, in particular, there's a lot of extra space looking at the traffic modeling. So with that space, what is proposed is widened sidewalks, landscape buffers from traffic, and a two-way cycle track on Ruby, all geared towards improving walk bike access to each transit station area. North of the couplet, up North Hill and beyond, it focuses primarily on the bus rapid transit improvements and the transit station areas um, due to more confined right away. So I'll pass it off to Amanda Beck to talk about phase two. Yeah, so building on all of the work that happened in phase one, which involved a lot of community engagement, um, Jason and all of the member agencies on the steering committee continued with the outreach to look at land use changes that could be recommended along the corridor, both in the city and the county, and then also active transportation projects that would be recommended that would support that BRT line. So all of that coalesced into phase two, which was um, a lot of number crunching on the consultant side, and then um, also looking at case studies for other corridors to recommend best practices that the city and the county could then go along and implement as we move along and update our comprehensive plans and our um, capital improvement plans. So some of that is tucked into the appendix. Um, so there is one that profiles all of the different land use nodes. So as we went along in the process, there were some nodes that were identified as places that we would likely want to see stations for the BRT line um, and kind of rank them in intensity, like that would be a first uh, stop, a main line trunk, if you will. Um, there's also a visual source book. So because these are recommendations to both us and the county, they wanted to provide us with ideas of what this would look like. What is a district center? What is a corridor node? Um, what would that look like? What kind of intensity? What kind of mixes of residential and retail and other uses would those have? 
And then also, again, that number crunching. So the consultant looked very heavily at travel demand modeling, what the implications would be if there was a no build scenario, if we went with the BRT to kind of do some com comparisons of how this could change traffic patterns. Um, so some of those are moving forward in our proposed resolution to council. Um, one of those would be the active transportation projects for walking and biking that would support the bus rapid transit line and also just cross connections within the city. Um, but this wraps up into an overall vision and strategy implementation for the corridor. Um, one of the things that is important with this is that this is corridor wide. This isn't just the city. We're looking from the start basically at the plaza for STA all the way into the county. Um, so we're trying to take a high level view, if you will, of how to implement this piece by piece along the corridor all the way into the county. Um, in addition to the recommendations for land use changes or opportunities to build greater transit-oriented development, there's also funding opportunities in some of the appendix um, that are included in the report. But so the resolution we drafted, which is based on resolution language from SRTC's board, would recognize the LPA as the desired future um, and that could be a guiding factor for the city in updates to our comprehensive plan and the projects we put into our capital improvements plan in addition to future changes that would guide the way we change the comprehensive plan in line with recommendations if that's the city's desire. What I will know is that Jason was the project manager and he is the ultimate authority, so if you guys have any questions, I might defer to him. Um, Amanda, Jason, hi, haven't seen you for a while. So this will also give us a heads up when it comes to applying for grants, I'm assuming because we will be coordinating with SRTC. So any grant opportunities, this will give us um, a leg up as, as you, if you will. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, Council. Jason Leon with SRTC. Uh, to answer your question, uh, I think one of the primary funding sources that will help fund this project, the, the transit line specifically, is uh, through the FTA Small Starts Program. So that's something that Spokane Transit would be pursuing. Um, I think based on their experience with the city line, they have a fair degree of confidence that they'll be successful through that program. Um, so that amount of federal funding can help support uh, construction of the stations and other amenities that go along with bus rapid transit, but also part of that funding can be corridor improvements that are identified in Division Connects that might be related to the pedestrian environment and other things. Great, thank you. I just want to add on to that real quick. In the appendix, you'll see 30% concepts for 30 uh, active transportation projects. Mm -hmm. So 30 walk bike projects have already been developed to 30% or 15 to 30%, and we're already uh, submitting applications to get that on the regional priority list for, for projects. I just wanted to add that real quick. Yeah, so um, I, I'm kind of curious in terms of, of the, the future after this. So if we, if we adopt this, and then of course, if it actually gets implemented, um, are there gonna be future changes to our uh, land use codes and whatnot in terms of how it relates to uh, Division Street, and I'm thinking in particular, you know, it's really designed as a traffic corridor, and now we're sort of moving it, or the idea, the concept is that it's going to become this multimodal corridor, but obviously we've got, you know, all kinds of ingress and egress, you know, um, th that whole way, and so I imagine there's going to have to be some substantial changes to make that safe. Uh, has that been thought through? Do we know what the, what the outlook on that is? So the level with this project was to make recommendations knowing that the, the bodies that were at the table weren't the jurisdictions in charge. Um, but what I would say is I think since we brought everyone, county, city, and Washtenaw together, we're aware that there are some significant obstacles in changing some of the right-of-way configurations. Um, but that being said, this kind of layers very nicely with other projects that planning services to so the TUD framework. A lot of these align with the same sort of recommendations when it comes to looking at the broader category of what kind of land uses would support 
um, high performance transit or are basically amenity rich if they aren't necessarily mixed use. Um, it would eventually lead to changes in the code itself and also updates to the comprehensive plan, but I think the way that the steering committee worked was to make sure that the, the report was drafted such that if that recommendation didn't feel correct for the city, that we weren't beholden to that particular item. So uh, just two more quick questions. One is, uh, are we continuing or, or S SRTC continuing to look at the data uh, in terms of traffic counts and whatnot to make sure that you know, when this road diet takes place that we aren't creating mass congestion? Because I, I, you know, I think the proposal last I saw was that this could start, start as early as 26, but the north-south isn't going to be done till 29. And so that's a, a pretty big gap where we could see some massive impacts in terms of congestion. So I'm wondering, have we looked at that data and is it continually being updated with new information since every day is a new day? Um, and then my second question on that is related to the, the busing aspect. Is, is it gonna be a dedicated lane for busing? And, and if so, will they have signal priority and all of that? Will it be a pretty robust system to move buses along? Uh, so I'll answer your, your, that question first. Uh, regarding the locally preferred alternative, it identified, if you've seen the concept, called business access and transit lanes. So the curbside lane is converted into what's known as a bat lane. That it basically is the, the throughway for the bus, but it also allows ingress and egress from properties and right turns. So it has dual functions uh, in, that, in that case. So it's not a truly dedicated transit lane. That is something that's kind of the highest level of BRT, you could say. We did consider that. We looked at that during the Division Connect study. We ultimately rolled that out and went with the, the bat lane concept. Um, in terms of how, I'm trying to recall your, your first question. Just data. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah data, thank you. Um, so uh, the Division Connect study has, has closed out. Uh, it has moved into the hands of STA in, st in terms of doing preliminary engineering design. As part of that process, uh, they'll be doing, you know, the kind of the nuts and bolts of designing the system, including looking at every intersection, looking at traffic impacts, looking at, you know, everything you can, you can imagine. And SRTC does continue to be involved in that process as well. So I would say as the design is being developed and all the specifics, there's a continual look at how this will affect operations on division, just to make sure that it's how it's phased in in terms of construction, how it's timed with the NSC completion, all those different aspects are all rolled into this larger preliminary engineering project that STA is managing. But all of us as, as partners are still involved in that. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to comment, Jason, thank you. So uh, Council Member Kinnear will be in chair as uh, STA next year. I'll be chair of SRTC. Our uh, transportation planners are at the table when all this is going on. So the city is pretty well informed and we are well informed too in the partnership because it really is a large collaborative uh, to move this type of project down the road. So uh, I'm pretty confident that it will be ongoing as we roll off and other people roll on. And what's the, uh, what's the year that we're assuming the North-South Corridor is going to be completed? Yeah, the construction and completion date is 2029. Okay. So are we factoring in how often that completion date moves as we're, as we're going through that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, yes, it, and I, I know that the, the state was looking at considering some additional funding opportunities that might even, hold your breath, <laughs> speed up completion of the MSC. Okay, shake your head. But, but, if, if that, um, but, but that's something that's being, being monitored. And, and certainly if um, there's more delays in the NSC that's going to you know, that, that'll be looked at closely and kind of coordinated accordingly with the, the division project. Yeah, because I think that's my, my greatest concern, and I, I know you are all very intelligent people, that you're very thoughtful, and so I don't want to take anything away from you, but my, my big concern there is, uh, you know, knowing how often that, that road is used, and with the North-South Corridor playing a big part of this whole plan together, with this one key piece that continues to move and, you know, uh, it, it really throws the whole, you know, a wrench in the, in, in the entire plan if that one isn't completed. So state legislators, please don't move it on us. Move it up if you're going to move it. Don't move it anywhere else. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's just my, my biggest concern in all of this. Yeah, I think our, ours as well. <laughs> so, so planning and funding are not always in step. That's the challenge. Thank you. 
since we went to the trouble of doing a thousand page attachment to this on page 992 of the appendix, and there's a traffic analysis table where you can see the volumes for 2030. Yeah. If you're interested. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Our next item is a resolution authorizing City Cable 5 to purchase and operate a broadcast quality drone. Our presenter is Mr. John DeLay. Good afternoon, Council. Um, the city's communication department is, is seeking the authorization to purchase a, a broadcast quality drone. Um, what this resolution does is it assures that we're complying with the city's privacy um, um, codes. Uh, we have solicited input from the Spokane Airport, uh, city's legal department, and uh, before Brian McClatchy left, uh, he had input on this as well. With me today, if, if you have any questions, is our uh, certified FAA drone pilot, uh, Jeff Bollinger, and also um, Tim Zamlin from legal. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Next item for advanced briefing is an ordinance vacating the alley between Everett Avenue and vacated Sanson Avenue. Our presenter is Mr. Eldon Brown. Good afternoon. We had the hearing on this vacation in, on September 19th of this year. It was approved subject to conditions. It's an alley up in the northeast part of town. Uh, we approved it through the non-user statute, which means it's a no-cost vacation. We are reserving an easement on the west 130 feet for a vista. They had some utilities in there, but we're ready for final reading of that ordinance next Monday. Be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Our next item under first reading ordinances is an ordinance adopting a city council redistricting plan. I believe this was advanced or uh, briefed or discussed at the Finance and Administration Committee meeting today. It was a few hours ago. Unless you have any additional questions. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Piccolo. And our final item, council president, members of the city council for the advanced briefing agenda for Monday, October 24 is a first reading ordinance establishing the City of Spokane is a zone free of nuclear armaments. And as I recall, this may have been briefed to committee uh, uh, last urban week. experience. Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. So as we discussed last time, it does three things that uh, makes it illegal to have nuclear weapons manufacturing in the city limits and nuclear weapons, uh, except for national security purposes. There's an exemption for that. It directs the city to come up with an investment policy regarding um, investments in companies that manufacture nuclear weapons, but it doesn't mandate any particular outcome. And then it directs the city not to procure goods from companies that manufacture nuclear weapons unless they're the sole source alternative. And Council President, I believe uh, Mr. Viviano is back online and able to brief us on consent items 10 and 11, which also include uh, special budget ordinances for the Human Services Grants Funds for those items. So, Devin? Can you hear me all? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, City Administrator Perkins and uh, Council. My sincere apologies for the uh, technical issues. I'll keep my commentary on WebEx mobile platform to myself so we can move forward, but I'm glad you can hear me. All so today I'm asking for uh, approval to move forward on a new round of emergency rental assistance funding as part of the COVID-related CARES Act funding. Um, one is for an ongoing program, actually the first one of significant amounts, which is the RA1 Treasury program. As we go deeper into that program and jurisdictions do not spend their allocation, they do reallocate that to other jurisdictions. I'm going to stop my video to make sure that the um, web isn't tested any further. 
so we received another 240,000 approximately in reallocated ERA-1 funds uh, that was distributed in June, and we've received another 215,000 um, that will go to the life stories demand and waiting list for those funds specifically with those eligibility requirements. The rest is the newest funding, that's a separate ERAP 2.0. Um, again, Commerce, after approving the previous round of funding in July uh, that we got out to the public uh, beginning in August, I gave the city another $1.725 million approximately after city admin costs about $1.638 million to the three partners. So we went before the RFP committee to confirm that it was appropriate to split that in the same manner that we did the first round of funding. Uh, all three of the uh, service providers agreed to that. They have the demand, they have the capacity. Um, and overall, even though it's not a fast process, we're really pleased with how this direct 2.0 funding is going so far in terms of uh, alleviating some of the stress that both landlords and tenants have at this point in the pandemic and getting people current on past rent utilities as well as future rent utilities. So I'm open to any questions if anybody should have any. Uh, Devin, do, you, do we know or does somebody know kind of how many open accounts there are uh, applicants for rental assistance? And, and will this get, get the rest of those covered, 50% uh, of them? I mean, where, where are we at? That's a really good, uh, good question, Council Lynn Cathcart, and it is kind of a golden question. Every time we open the portal, there's a hope, of course, that supply funding will actually exceed demand and the number of applications. Unfortunately, that's not the case of what happened in, in August, and because we have to be a bit all or nothing on closing the portal, we don't at this time have the capacity to maintain like, a kind of master waiting list. We're kind of going off of anecdotal what we hear from um, from 311, for example, how many people call expressing uh, frustration for not being able to get funding on the most recent round because it was exhausted before they could. The question that we know those people ask the question is how many, <clears throat> and then well, we are uh, doing a lot of different way, things to have learned from our previous um, lessons of, of how to do this, and we did set some money aside for the most urgent cases. So if somebody truly is facing uh, a current eviction notice, they do have some options to go through the, the, the street resolution centers and hopefully find um, a resolution even if the portals are, are paused. Because when we receive this money, uh, we, it's yet to be seen whether it's going to go towards current applications um, or whether we'll be able to open the portals and accept ex some new ones. What we do know for sure is that the demand is there uh, and very much needed. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt the advanced agenda as read? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? The advanced agenda is adopted. That brings us to tonight's agenda, and there were a few different uh, matters. A little bit pressed for time, but let me go to the consent agenda, there's two items that are wanting to be added. Uh, one for some money from WashDOT and one for the revived counseling services contract. And I'm waiting. I had a note that there was yet maybe another little adjustment to the, wash, to the revived contract. But first, is there a motion to suspend the rules to allow the addition of items? So move suspension of the rules. Second. All right, any discussion on the move to suspend? I'm sorry, I missed who seconded it. Me. Oh, thank you. Stratton. No. All no. right, any discussion? All right, all those in favor of suspending the rules to add things to the agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Uh, is there a motion to add items 11 and 12 as currently uh, filed? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, any abstentions? All right, those items are added. Um, let me, might have to do some of this at the main meeting, but let me switch over to page eight. Uh, the motion to, actually, before we do page. Uh, can I? May I, um, number five on the consent, could we um, defer for a week? Okay. 
You have a motion to defer for a week? Yes, motion to defer for a week. I, I need more information that I haven't received yet. Okay, about fire vehicles? Yes. Okay, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, I spoke with both um, Chief and um, the union and I think we'll get more information on this um, probably today. Any other? All those in favor of deferring for a week until October 24th, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? Council President, yeah. on uh, page 7, uh, 36282, um, I'm just trying to figure out how to um, uh, separate out the retainage from the vehicles and um, support the retainage in this SBO and, and defer the vehicles to 2023. Okay. And I'm not sure if, if we simply struck number seven from that ordinance, but uh, without any other strikes from the appropriations, is that gonna screw things up? I'm just trying to get a, <laughs> is, there, is that a simple let's, way? That we can let's have? do this, because I think we should check with our finance people. Yeah. Let's, we can do that at six. Okay. Um, but yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to page nine. Um, where it's a resolution. Is there a motion to add resolution 94 to tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, now, Councilmember Cathcart, you wanted to move to substitute, right? Do you, do you want me to read it again or? Just. I would just say move to substitute your version. I, I, I move to substitute the version that I presented earlier. Okay. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, that's, at, that's substituted. Um, all right, then Again, this would just be for adding to the agenda. There might be some more. We're getting emails about this, but adding money to fund the revive contract for services at the Trent Shelter is item ordinance C36302. Might need to change some language before six o'clock or at six o'clock, but all those, or is there a motion to add it to the agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Yeah. So, I support the uh, uh, the contract um, in and of itself. Just where the money is coming from is where I'm, I'm still confused, and so I didn't um, know that this was going to be on there tonight. I'll I'll have some questions. Maybe we can get some answers from that okay. before we move that on. Okay. So at this point, the motion is just to add it to the agenda. Mm -hmm. We might defer it. We might change it. We're still, like I say, getting emails. And this has the correct amount on it. Okay. Um, that's, that was the difference uh, from earlier. Okay. What's the correct amount again? Um, one, one mil, five. yeah, 1570. Before it was 1507. Okay. Transposition. All those in favor of adding to the agenda indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? <clears throat> Any extensions? All right, that's added. And again, we might, I'm waiting for another version of that contract it fills in a couple of blanks, but we can do that at six o'clock. Okay. Okay. All right. I think that's all on this. So we're adjourned till six o'clock. <laughs>